So while we're warming up and waiting, I'd like to do polls with people. Um, so unrelated directly to this, how many of you are running Java 8? Anybody here not running Java 8? Hand up. OK, a couple. How about before 8? 6 or 7? I feel your pain. Okay. Um, how about 11 in production? Good. How about after 11? 12, 13, 14 early access, 15 not even early access? No. OK. OK, that's, that's good. I like, I like to kind of pull the get a feel for that because I, I try to see how it is. So it's really cool to see a few people here actually are at 11 in production. Um, and, and is that, are you also one of the people that said you don't have any 8 anymore or do you have both? We have both 8 and 11. OK. But 11 is in production. Good. More of you should try. <laughs> uh, like, just community-wise, we kind of want to move there. 11 is now a year and some old. It's actually starting to show the kind of behavior that Java has when it's a year and some old, which is kind of courageous people go to production. And, and you guys should all thank them, because they're the ones who file the bugs. And now we can make it good for everybody else. OK, so looks like we're in the right minute. Um, I can start on the actual subject. And, and um, this is a subject I've, I've spoken about now for quite a while. In fact, I've stopped speaking about it because I got sick of doing the talk. Uh, every time I put it up, that's the talk everybody wanted to hear. So, um, and and you know, after doing it probably 100 times, I stopped. That was a few years ago. This is a refreshed version of the same thing. It's kind of modern, up to date, but you'll see a lot of the same stuff from before. Anybody here has anybody here seen my previous versions of GC Talks? Okay, good. So for most of you, it's new. You'll you'll recognize some of the jokes, unfortunately, <laughs> but you know, good, uh, and and some of the slides maybe. Okay, I like to start a lot of my talks with this picture. Anybody here know what this thing is? Apollo 13. That is the CO2 scrubber from the Apollo 15 uh, spaceship. They basically had to figure out how to fit a square peg into a round hole from hundreds of thousands of miles away with astronauts' lives on the line because they had an accident. They can land on the moon. They had to make it back. There's a whole movie about this, right? But the key thing about this is the duct tape. This is the ultimate in duct tape engineering. Like, this is beautiful. Save people's lives, save the day, duct tape engineering. And, and, and whenever you, in your real life and career, encounter the opportunity to do some, something like this, uh, I know I've done a few of these, hopefully with, not with people's lives on the line, but, but save the day kind of things. It's broken, no time, you've got to figure it out and just save it. it. It's an amazing feeling. But at the same time, um, it is most of our jobs to make that never happen again. Like after you've saved the day, the fact that you had the skill to do that is great. But then we're supposed to look at this and say, how do I make it so we don't have to do it again? And in this case, hopefully they went back and the next Apollo mission went out with CO2 filters that are the same shape for the two different parts so they don't have to do it again, right? You can eliminate the need for the duct tape. And eliminating duct tape is a lot of what good software engineering is about. When you see duct tape on stuff, you can feel really good and heroic about what you did, but remember that your job is actually in the long run to get rid of the duct tape. And we might weave that into the talk today. I almost always find some way to put that in. So understanding garbage collection. Um, and and we're, I, I've talked on the subject a lot. Um, there are a lot of other good talks around that you can find about the latest GC developments. Um, the, the way this, this talk works is it's not a GC talk about a specific way to do something about GC. It's focused on education and how things work. The idea is if, if I can get your brain to kind of have the model in it and understand the parts, um, 
you can then apply that knowledge with smarts. So this is not a how to tune a GC talk. This is not a what flug does what kind of thing, or which GC do you do in which mode. This is how do these things work? What are the qualities? What do the words mean? What do they really mean? And, and then we'll look at, hopefully, some, some practical things in there. Um, so this is about how things work, right? Um, now, you learn a bunch of stuff here. This is only 50 minutes. Unfortunately, I can't give you a full GC education in 50 minutes, but you'll get enough to be dangerous. And I will be talking at the end about how Azul makes the greatest garbage collector on Earth. And the whole purpose of this talk is so that at the end you can understand why, right? So the last few minutes will be me bragging, and I will try to hold back until then, okay? Until then, I'm giving you an education that's general, and I will try to be somewhat um, um, even in my description of mechanisms. So the high-level agenda, we'll talk about some GC fundamentals and terminology. We'll classify current available collectors. We'll talk about why stop the world is a problem. Then we'll look at some concurrent approaches, and then we'll talk about the C4 collector and how it solves the stop the world problem. Um, I'm Gil Tenner, I'm the CTO of Azul Systems. I've been doing this for a while, and probably what I'm best known for is building a different way to do garbage collectors. Probably the way that is now being imitated by other garbage collectors, which I think is a great thing. Finally, we have all the modern collectors moving in the same direction. We started this when this wasn't a popular thing to do. We were going in the opposite direction of everybody. And here's some evidence of me working on the actual problem. And I apologize, you've seen that before, but yeah. <laughs> so this is, you know, me actually fixing a garbage collection problem in my house. That is a trash compactor. If you think about the job of a trash compactor, it's supposed to do minor GC compactions so that the full GC only happens on the weekend. A and here I had a problem because there was fragmentation and it stopped the collector from compacting right and I had to open and manually defragment the heap of garbage and put it back together and I thought it'd be funny to take a picture with the GC book, the actual GC book. The most important piece of information about this picture is the date. This is 15 years ago. I had a little, I was, I looked better, I think. <laughs> um, and, and I still think it's a little funny and I'm kind of mostly lazy and I recycle pictures and now you know a lot about me. Um, so I, I created the Posilus GC algorithm and the C4 algorithm. It's my baby. Um, built it over years, tuned it. I, I think we know a lot about this space. We basically have the crown jewel of garbage collectors in production, and we're happy to see others come to the game. Um, I also have a long history of building a lot of other things. We won't get into those. And I really like to depress people by telling them how everything they measure about response time and latency is wrong. If you go to the internet and Google my name and latency, you'll see a lot of things that will make you wish you didn't see them. Um, but it's a hobby of mine. I just like to show people how everything they do is broken. And somehow they like hearing about it. Uh, so this one is not going to be about how things are broken. But in the same spirit of polling the audience, I want to ask here, see ranges. So you all run some sort of Java. You said you had Java 8. so. How many of you have more than half a gigabyte heap in your application, in at least one of your common applications today? Okay, so looking around, it's the vast majority. Uh, keep your hands up. We'll start dropping them. Above a gig? Yeah. Above two gig? OK, a couple drop there. Above four gig? A lot more drop. Wow. Above 10 gig? Ah. Look around. Above 20? Above 50? Ah, we're done, right? So who was here above 20? We need to talk. <laughs> OK. <laughs> but but uh, this, I do this poll. I used to do it a lot. And this profile hasn't really changed in about 10 years, which is kind of scary, because we've gotten a lot more memory for the same price in that amount of time, which tells us that something has been keeping people from using more than that in the vast majority of applications. That's something, in my opinion, is garbage collection. And I'm happy that now we have mainstream moves to solve it completely. Um, see, the guess was right there. OK, so why do you need to understand a little about this? I'll do a little motivation. 
I have a story I like to say called the story of the good little architect. And we ran into, this is a real story. We ran into this early in the days of our, of our concurrent garbage collectors. I define a good architect not as somebody who makes a good design, but as somebody who gets this, basically gets people to adopt their design. Like, if, if you don't get people to implement what you design, it doesn't matter how good or bad it is, you're just an armchair, you know, philosopher. Uh, if people build what you design, you're an actual architect, and then we could look at what's good and bad about that, right? Uh, in, in early in our concurrent GC activities, we ran into an actual application that on our pauseless GC had an 18 second pause, which was very embarrassing. Uh, so we went and investigated what's going on. And when we investigated, we found out that in this application, it was built by a team of, I don't remember, 10 to 15 people over a course of a year and a half. Every single Java class written had a finalizer. Not some of them had it. Every class, every object had a finalizer. Um, and basically what was happening is we're seeing tens of millions of, GC of, of, of finalizations happening per GC cycle. At the time, we were doing the final reference handling and the reference handling in general in a stop the world thing, because that was tiny, right? But this application didn't have it as tiny. We've, we've long ago fixed that. That's, that's been out of the design for a while, but you know, every class had a finalizer in it. So we try to figure out how and why. And you step back and you look at this, this is not an accident, this is by design. So anybody want to guess what the finalizer was doing? Logging, releasing memory, metrics, no. releasing memory how? Clean. That. Finalizer set every reference to null. Now, it, it, some of you might not quite get why, some of you think that's funny, but this really did it, right? And, and, and to give you a hint, that is the worst possible thing you could do in Java to a garbage collector, to have a finalizer that set everything to null, because it does nothing good, and it only does the worst possible thing the collector could see, which is have to run a finalizer. Um, now, why did this happen? Because there are languages where that design is exactly the right design, C++ being one where you you really want to have a discipline around having destructors everywhere. The destructors really do clean up. If you miss one, you've got memory leaks and other problems. So this is a C++ discipline applied to Java. It's a great example of how the C++ discipline applied to Java is the absolute wrong thing to do because garbage collection. So why do you need to understand what garbage collection does? Because if you do that, you're going to have terrible, terrible behavior. And someday people will tell stories about you at conferences. Um, so, at least that's a motivating thing. You need to understand this even if you're not designing one. This is a good example of why it's bad. And we'll get to the math for why it's bad in a little while. Um, so lots of what people know about garbage collectors is kind of wrong. Uh, here are some things that are probably much better than you think. Garbage collection is extremely efficient. It's actually the most efficient possible way to, uh, to manage dynamically allocated memory. It's faster than malloc. It's more efficient than malloc. It takes less CPU than malloc, if done right. Um, dead object costs nothing to collect. All efficient garbage collectors spend basically their algorithmic design effort to avoid ever looking at dead stuff which is why a finalizer is the worst possible thing to you could make a garbage collector do. You're forcing it to look at every dead object, which it could have avoided otherwise. It's the thing that makes the GC a hundred or a thousand times more expensive. So don't do it. Right? Um, and we will find all the dead objects. We don't need help. You don't need to know any references. If it's dead, it's dead. If it's alive, it's alive. You don't have to change things. Now, it's, you do need to forget things for them to be collected. If you just grow your life set, you're going to blow up. But you don't have to go around helping the collector, breaking chains, putting nulls. If you're dead, you're not keeping anything alive. You don't need to know anything. Okay? And here are things that are typically a lot worse than you want, you might think. And, and you know, it really will stop for about a, a second per gigabyte of life set in virtually all the current production collectors except for one. 
the future collectors might have eliminate that. Some of the experimental ones other than C4 are also doing that now. But in production collectors, except for Zing right now, that's an absolute truth. It's not an if, it's a when. Eventually this will happen. And basically, if you have garbage collectors, that doesn't mean you don't leak memory. You can still do very creative ways of leaking memory. It just eliminates a lot of the silly ways to leak memory. Uh, to, to, to leak memory. And, and the other one is that when you tune things and you've managed to make your test pass by going 20 minutes without a GC that ruined your life, most likely you just move, move the bad thing to minute 21. Most of GC tuning is basically pushing problems under the carpet into the future so somebody else will deal with them. But in production for long uh, runs, it's hard to do. So let's talk about terminology. Um, simple terms and classifications. Um, concurrency and parallelism. How many here know the difference between concurrent and parallel GC? Good, that's more than normal. But for the rest of you, let me define them. A concurrent collector is a, con is a collector that does the collection work concurrently with your application. The collector is running and you're running at the same time. In the last 20 to 25 years, we call that concurrent. A parallel collector is a collector that uses more than one thread to do GC. Can use more than one CPU at a time. You, these things have nothing to do with each other. You could be parallel but not concurrent. In fact, most of them are. You could be concurrent but not parallel, which would be a silly thing to do on modern CPUs, but it's possible. You could be both and you could be neither. Okay? These are orthogonal terms. It is a confusing thing because in some languages, like Hebrew that I grew up on, these are the same word. Right? <laughs> so the nuance between concurrent and parallel is there. And if you go back 35 years in academic papers, you will find people talking about what we today call concurrent as parallel. So unfortunately, the meaning shifts. But this is the current accepted meaning for at least two decades. Okay? Um, some additional definitions. Stop the world. You hear that a lot. What does it mean? It means that we perform a collection, or at least a part of the collection, with your application completely stopped. Stop the world is the opposite of concurrent. Okay? At least in the part that it happens in. Monolithic means all in one piece, right? Um, and, and the monolithic uh, operation, not necessarily a collector, but an operation, is kind of an all or nothing operation. Once you start it, you have to finish it. You can't stop in the middle, let you run for a while, and then start again. The opposite of that is incremental. You can do a little, stop you, do a little work, let you go. Stop, do a little work, let you go. You could go back and forth in those, okay? Um, now there's a really, really important word in GC terminology. It's called mostly. <laughs> mostly means exactly what it means, but you gotta read it very carefully, or more likely, whenever you see the word the word mostly in a sentence, you have to read the rest of the sentence carefully because mostly means whatever you read after this won't actually happen. It'll only sometimes happen. Mostly parallel means sometimes serial. Mostly concurrent means sometimes stop the world. Mostly incremental means sometimes monolithic. And you will see the word mostly instead of in front of the good words when people want to politely say, I'm going to do the bad thing. Okay? And this is the actual terminology used in actual descriptions. Now, to be fair, in academic papers, it's described for honesty. There are, like, the CMS collector is documented in academic papers as a mostly concurrent collector. When marketing people get hold of that, you know, they run wild with the world, word concurrent, unfortunately. Okay, I'm going to define one more important word because it's relevant to what we're going to talk about, and that's the word experimental. Experimental in garbage collection terms means you are lucky if it crashes. Because when you're not lucky, it corrupted your heap, it ended up with wrong math, and you don't know about it. Okay, so if it's crashing, you should be happy. <laughs> I, I'm saying this because I really want the expectations to be set right. There's some really good experimental collector work going out there. When it matures to be non-experimental, it'll provide very good value. But until then, you need to realize that what it means is it's going around scrambling random numbers on your numbers. And, and you will find bugs documenting that exact behavior where the JIT compilers right now are not quite doing this right and not keeping the variance right and 
weird things can happen, but hey, it's experimental. So remember that when you turn on the use experimental features, that's what it means. Okay. Eventually it won't when you don't have to use the experimental features flag to enable the thing. Okay, precise and conservative collection. Again, we're in the definition phases. Um, a collector is conservative when it doesn't exactly know where all the references in the world are, where all the pointers are. When it doesn't exactly know that, um, you know, it, it's limited in what it can do. A collector is precise when it does know where all the references are, when it does some collection work. It doesn't need to do it all the time, but when it performs collection work, it knows exactly where every reference is. The difference between this is these two is, are critical because if you want to move any object from point A to point B in the world, you have to know where all the references are because you have to fix all of them to point to B instead of A, and if you miss one, you're an experimental collector. Okay. Um, that's exactly, by the way, how experimental collectors uh, 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 basically corrupt the heap, right? They, they fixed 999,000 pointers, but there's one that they forgot. And that one, which is really hard to debug and find out until you bake all this out, is the thing that will actually make weird things happen. Um, all the commercial JVMs today are precise. There are no JVMs I know of, of any kind, that do not use a precise collector. It's been true for almost 23 years, okay? 22, probably. And all of them use some form of a moving collector. Every single one of them. Objects will move. They're not just kept in place. Okay. We talked about knowing where the pointers are. Let's talk about safe points. A GC safe point is a range of execution and code where we know where the pointers are. Okay. Um, we, I'll use that interchangeably, but, and there are other kinds of safe points, but when we say bring a thread to a safe point, we mean bring it to that range of code where I know where all the pointers are. The JVM actually keeps things called OOP maps that describe for code locations or ranges where all the pointers are on the stack when you're here. Now, this sounds a lot like stop the thread at that point, and if you're in Java code, that's exactly what it means. Um, but um, there are many ways you could be still running, but at a safe point. Being inside a JNI call or being blocked on a read, which is always inside a JNI call, is a good example of that. You could be in a wide range of code, but still at a safe point, because we know where all the Java references are. So whenever we enter JNI, we're in safe points. You could be there for an hour inverting a matrix. That's fine. You're still at a safe point. You just can't come back until we're past the safe point. Um, when we talk about a global safe point, that means bring all the threads to a safe point at the same time. Again, often when people say safe point, what they mean is global safe point. A stop the world pause is when we make a global safe point happen. All the threads are stopped at a good point in code where we know where everything is at the same time. We use a, a mechanism we call a checkpoint, which doesn't stop everybody, just makes everybody roll through one. A thread local safe point that you get in and get out, but you do something in the middle because you know where things are. That's not a global safe point. It's a per thread running safe point. Okay. Now, here are some behaviors that are common to pretty much every GC you'll run into, at least in the Java world. Every precise GC will do these three things. The first one is it's going to identify all the live stuff. It's going to figure out where it is. It's going to reclaim resources of dead stuff and somehow recycle them. And it will periodically relocate objects. It'll take objects from one place to another and move them. Every one of these things will happen. Let's run examples of two classic mechanisms you might have heard of. The first one is mark sweep compact, and the other one is a copying uh, collector. In the mark sweep compact example, you do A, B, and C. The first one is mark, find all the live stuff. The second one is sweep, find all the dead stuff and figure out how to recycle it. The third one is compact, move stuff around because, right? Copying collectors do all three of these as one pass. It's not three different things. A copy collector generally says, I have everything here from space is what we usually call it. And I'm going to take all the live stuff and move it here to, to spice. So I'm going to find all the live stuff, move it as I find it, put it over there. And when I'm done, the from space is empty. 
I find all the life stuff. I move all the life stuff, that's point three. And as a result, I reclaim all the dead stuff. It's a single pass that does all that in one pass. It's not a multi-pass operation, but still you do all those. So let's break that into pieces and look at the common operations. The first one is mark. Marking basically is finding all the life stuff we can reach. And marking generally starts from what we call the roots. These are static variables, your thread stacks, things like that. We find the references there and we follow them. We start there and we follow them and we basically paint anything we can reach. That's alive. Then we follow that. If there are references in there, we keep following and following. If we reach something that is already painted alive, we don't need to go further. But if we reach something that isn't painted, painted we drill and keep going. When we do that and we're out of work, we can't reach anything anymore that isn't already painted alive, we're done. We have painted everything we can reach from the roots as live. And when we did this, all non-reachable objects are not painted live. So everything that is not reachable has now been identified. This is why GCs do not need help finding dead stuff. It's why we don't need null references nulled or non-null references and dead stuff nulled. If you're not reachable, we're not going to follow your references anyway. And if you are reachable, it doesn't help. You're not going to be called in a finalizer. Um, so we basically know where the dead stuff is. We're one of the live stuff. Great. That's the marking parts, often called tracing in academic language. From a complexity point of view, marking is linear to the live set. We have to visit every object and follow any, every reference. But that's how much live stuff there is. If I have a huge empty heap or a very full heap, it doesn't change the work. What changes is how much live memory there is, OK? Sweeping is really, really simple. Once we've marked, we just scan through everything, and we look at all the non-live stuff and track it somehow in some free lists or some other way to recycle. For example, if it's a free list, I know I could put something there. Or maybe I can compact into it or something like that. So. It's trivial. You just sweep the whole thing and find all the dead stuff and keep track of it, bookkeeping. Complexity-wise, you have to sweep the whole thing. There's no helping that, right? So you basically have to be linear to the amount of heap. It doesn't matter how much there is alive or dead. You will visit everything. Okay, so if you have a full heap, it's the same as marking. If you have a 1% utilized heap, you're sweeping 100 times as much stuff as you're marking. Compacting. Well, to start with, what is compacting about? Compacting is what you do because the memory gets Swiss cheese holes of it, in it over time. And over time, while things move around or live and die and all that, you get a lot of empty memory, but it's not necessarily contiguous. So you could be 90% empty, but no room to allocate a 10 kilobyte array, which would be embarrassing to throw an out-of-memory exception on. So at that point, you have to do something. And Generally, because of performance, we don't like to break our objects into pieces. So we make big contiguous areas by moving the things together and compacting them. That's the motivation. Generally, compacting involves moving live objects to new locations. For example, push everything to the left so the right will be nice and contiguous. And it involves correcting all the references in the world to those objects to point to their new locations. Both things have to happen, OK? So one is relocation. The other one is either remap or fix up, depending on the terminology you use. I, I use them interchangeably. These are two different things that need to happen separately. Um, now, a remap must cover every reference in the world. So you move one object, you need to ch make sure there's no reference left to it anywhere, which is why you never move one object. Because if you move one object or 100 objects, you have to visit the same number of places to figure out if you need to fix them. So you may as well move as much as you can. Most compactors move the entire heap in one pass because then they only need to do one fix up pass. Complexity wise, even though compaction seems to be the worst thing that people end up having to do, it's still only linear to the live set. You have to move all the live objects and fix all the live references. You don't have to do anything about that stuff. OK, so that was mark, sweep, and compact. Let's look at copying. Copying, as I said before, is you take all the l objects from a from space, and you say, I'll follow the roots, and anything I find, I'll 
copy over, and then I'll follow it and everything I find I'll copy over. Basically, you pull everything into the two space as you go in a single pass. And when you're done, everything's in the two space, and the from space is dead and empty, and you never visit in any of it, right? Note that there's no sweep operation in a copy. The nice thing here is it's linear only to the live set. We visit all the live stuff. We copy all the live stuff. As we copy, we fix the references to the things we're copying, and we never visit any of the dead stuff. We never sweep the memory. It's a great efficiency benefit of copying collectors. So let's compare some of the qualities of these things. Copying is really nice efficiency-wise, but unfortunately it needs twice the memory. Because when you start, you have no idea if everything is dead or everything is alive. And you need a place to put it that's not the from. So the two may need to be as big as the from, and you don't know when you start what it needs to be. So you need room. Otherwise, you'll be stuck in the middle, and usually copying is monolithic. Mark and compact typically need twice the maximum live set in order to fully compact, recover the thing. Twice the live set, not twice the heap. But since you don't know what the live set is, same thing. Now, the thing is that if you want to do that in a single cycle, they need that, but they could usually be interrupted in the middle. So, for example, you can optimistically hope that you don't need that much, and if there's no room, you just stop. Let's do another cycle later. Mark Sweep Compact in virtual AL implementations needs no extra memory. What you do is you mark everything, and then you sweep to figure out where the holes are, and then you move everything within, it's kind of compact in place. You shuffle everything to one side, filling the holes with objects because you know where they are, and you don't need anywhere else to put them. So they don't you don't need extra external room in order to achieve compaction, which from a space perspective is a great benefit. Um, and then copy and mark compact are linear only to the live set, but mark sweep compact is also linear to the heap size. Um, mark sweep and sometimes compact is an interesting way to avoid the work sometimes, and we'll touch on that, and I think I already <coughs> said that copying is monolithic. Now I'm going to take these qualities and put them together into a very interesting and very important observation from 1984. Not the book, uh, but you know, that's now, what, 35 years ago? Yeah, yep. So, but it's been true since then. And generational collection relies on something called the weak generational hypothesis or observation. Most objects die young. For some reason, the way we write software has this quality in a virtually universal way. Even applications that have tons of stable live stuff tend to churn a few temporary objects while you make the live stuff. So whether it's 2 to 1, 10 to 1, 100 to 1, most objects tend to die young. And luckily, we're still in this world where that happens. The way you leverage this quality is you pick a collection algorithm that will thrive in that universe. When you know that most objects die young, what you try to do is separate a part of the heap that is young. You know it's young, so most things in it are dead. And knowing that it's probably very, very sparse, meaning the live set is a tiny fraction of the heap size, you choose algorithms that are only linear to the live set and avoid anything that is linear to the heap size. And by doing that, the, com the work you end up having to do in your collector shrinks with the live set, knowing that it's sparse means it's shrunk dr dramatically. So what you do is you, you keep this area of heap where this is true, and you work hard to keep it that way. The way you work hard to keep it that way is, okay, young stuff is dying, right? But stuff that doesn't die, older stuff, needs to be out of here, otherwise we'll get full and not sparse. So promotion is the act of taking things from the young generation and pushing them somewhere else so the young generation will remain sparse. If you don't promote, eventually the young generation stops being sparse, all the benefit goes away. So promotion is a necessary behavior in order to make generation collector work, period. I've seen people do cool things like turn off promotion on the young gen, and all they did is make a young gen single generation thing. Cool, but you know, that's that, that you lose on the other end. Um, the efficiency here is extreme. So, what you do is once you fill the other part of the heap, the old generation or older generations, you, you collect those using some other algorithm. 
but by doing this and focusing on the young generation and hoping that the vast majority of allocated objects just die there, you focus most of your collection work with a hyper-efficient algorithm. And the most, the common algorithm you'll see is the copy collector in that, but there are other algorithms that work for that as well. This tends to be good for 10x to 20x enhancements in GC efficiency in CPU per allocation. It's why GCs can be very efficient, but it's also why if you somehow get out of this mode, you'll, keep, you'll be very, very bad at efficiency. Again, if the new gen had to visit every object to call the finalizer, we're done. Okay, so generation collection, to do this magic, needs to have this part of the heap that it collects without doing the rest. And to do that, it needs something we call a remembered set. There are other uses for remembered sets, but in generation collection, what we mean by remembered set is, in addition to the other roots we talked about, there's this big other part of the heap. I need to know about all the pointers from there into the young generation. Because for the young generation, those are also roots. So we need to treat anything pointing into the young generation from the other parts of the heap, the old generation, as a root. And to do that, we track things in things like card tables and other cool structures that are very efficient. Now, the cool thing about this is because if, if we apply a copy, generation, a copy collector to the young gen, we also don't need a 2x in there because if, if we can't fit you know, the thing into the two space that is smaller than the from space, we just, we just promote it. Uh, if you've seen the setup at Hotspot and, and OpenJK, generally the Eden uh, is, is the, the young gen is broken into an Eden and very small survivor spaces, which are the two space. They're not evenly sized. And if you can't fit everything that's alive in the Eden into a survivor space, you just promote it. That's called premature promotion. Right? So at least the joke name for it. Um, so you know, usually you want to keep things there a little bit. You don't want to promote them immediately because if you promote them the second you find them, there's this edge of them being alive and a lot of them. And if you just let them stay there for one more cycle, they would have died. Uh, but also, if you keep them there too long, you lose the sparseness and the efficiency. So there's some sort of a sweet spot for living there. Luckily, that sweet spot is huge, really, really big. If you draw it too tiny, you, start, you lose completely. But usually, if you set the new gen to huge, you don't lose efficiency. If you try and change it so it never promotes, you lose efficiency. Typical combinations of these things showing up in production will look like this. The young generation of most collectors and will be a copying collector. It'll usually be a monolithic, stop the world copying collector. I've defined every word now. So carefully, I think I've defined every word. So hopefully there's a, there's a dictionary in front of you now. The old generation is usually some form of a mark sweep compact or mark compact. And it could be any of these combinations. It could be stop the world. It could be concurrent or mostly concurrent or incremental stop the world or mostly incremental stop the world. All kinds of variations. The variations we see are usually in the old generation collector. Usually people name their algorithm, their collector, for the behavior of the old generation. So before we go into actual classification, let's talk about non-stop the world tricks. Um, concurrent marking is one thing that you kind of need to do unless you're willing to stall the entire application while you figure out what's alive. Uh, and various collectors already do concurrent marking, including CMS and G1 and Shenandoah and ZGC and C4. Um, but one common way to look at this is we need to mark all the objects live. And if you were stopped, this is easy. We just went through what that does and it's trivial, right? But what if the application is running while we're doing this? Well, there's a fundamental race, and luckily only one race that we need to figure out. And it's the concurrent marking race. And it looks something like this. Um, basically, um, as, you, as you move through, uh, does that work? Yeah. As you move through, you paint everything that you see alive. And that would be fine. But imagine that the application takes a reference to an object I haven't gotten yet and then deposits it into an object that I've already visited, so behind me. I've got this wavefront going. And then gets rid of it over here. So it still exists. They put it there. I don't see them putting it there. So I run my liveness thing. I mark. I'm done. I think everything's good, but I never saw this reference. And it is alive. It's just behind me. 
And that's the fundamental race between a marker and an application that we, we call the application a mutator. We call you guys mutators. Because okay? um, you mutate the, the shape of the object graph. Uh, and it's a fundamental race, and you need to somehow prevent it, deal with it, handle it. One common technique is to say, let it happen. But as it goes, every time you touch a reference, keep track of the fact that you touched it. Uh, for example, dirty a card somewhere that said somebody touched stuff there. So when we finish one pass, we, we go and say, well, but did anybody touch anything? And then you go look at all the places they touched stuff, and you mark those. And while you do that, you track whether anybody touched anything. And when you're done, you go back and say, well, did, you know, and you keep doing this. And you're hoping that the touched anything set gets smaller enough. And at the end, you say, you know, let's just stop and do the final marking. The final remarking, you've seen those in GC logs, I assume, which says, okay, stop them, let's just catch up the, f the end, and hopefully that end is really small. That's a mostly concurrent marker. Very effective, but, for example, um, well, there, there are various things that can happen, but for example, you keep creating work by mutating references. So if you run really fast and keep touching references, its work is never done, so it has to eventually stop the world to do it. In that stop the world, they might find half the heap is alive and stop the world for that. So technically, you can have huge glitches. But as long as it works out, it works out. Um, incremental compaction is another interesting way to deal with or combat with the the monolithic stop the world art, uh, behavior. Our big problem is big pauses. So maybe we can replace them by a lot of little pauses. Right? So incremental compaction takes the, the idea of tracking references from one region to another, and then having sets of regions that you can compact. And then I don't have to go look at the whole heap to fix up everything. I'll just have to look at the parts of the heap that point to me. So if I have, say, seven regions that have 100 regions pointing to them, I can compact the seven and only visit and fix up these 100 and not the 1,000 other regions that don't have pointers here. That's the hope. And you end up with these sets where you just do a compaction of a set of regions, fix up everything for that region, which is not the whole heap, let you go, and then do it again and again and other increments. Um, this works pretty well, but it has an n-square complexity problem because the number of regions in the heap grows with the heap, and the number of references from one region to another in the heap grows with the number of regions in the heap, because this is just all rolling dice. None of us have control over which region is pointing to which, so it's just random. So as you grow the heap, you, bo you both grow the number of regions that need to be compacted, and the number of regions that point to each region that need to be compacted, and you end up with an n-square complexity problem. It works great when n is really small. As n grows, you have a problem. Um, so all these games that we talked about are basically delaying the inevitable, which is the big bad thing everybody's trying to avoid, compacting the heap. right? Um, and then you can think of it as, for example, delay tactics around as the empty space, like generational collection, let us, you know, deal with the empty stuff that's young very efficiently. And we get a lot of small pauses, very efficient collection. But eventually, we have to deal with the old stuff. It will fill up, right? And if we go past the young generation, we can look at this and say, well, the old thing is mostly dead, but maybe we can recycle it in place, right? There's holes here. Let's put things in the holes so we don't have to compact. That's what CMS does, by the way. But eventually, that will get fragmented and then you will have to compact it. That's what a full GC is in CMS. And then you can take the G1 and balanced collector approach that says, well, okay, that doesn't work. We can't afford to sometimes compact the entire heap in one big shot. So let's do incremental compaction, which is a fundamental mechanism in both of these for dealing with it. Instead of one huge pause, we'll do lots of little pieces uh, and, and basically deal with non-popular things and in interesting ways and huge things in interesting ways. But eventually, you can end up with some popular objects in, pop in almost any region and have to fall back to compact the whole thing in one big pause. Because if you have a popular region and you have to compact it, popular a popular region means everybody's pointing here. So if I compact it, I have to 
fix the whole heap in one shot. And you can say, OK, let's not compact that one. Then you get a, a popular object in another region, another region. Eventually, you get backed into a corner, and you have to do the whole thing. So these are all improvements. Each one of them got us further, swept the big bad pause a little further into the future. Maybe even for your application, made it so you crash before that happens, because you guys have bugs. You know, it's really a race between that and you. Um, so let's now classify the collectors quickly. And we're doing OK on time, I believe. Yeah. Um, I'll classify the collectors or the common collectors. Now, this is from the slide that's been around for now seven or eight years. But I'm going to just jigger that a little. These are not the common collectors. These are the legacy collectors. We're now in a world where you already know what the new collectors are going to be. We will talk about them. But let's classify the ones that are there, because they're the ones that, for example, Java 8 still has, and Java 11 still has in non-experimental mode. So I, I told you before, this is the common thing you will see. Let's classify them one by one. Parallel GC, still the most popular garbage collector in the Java world for one really simple reason. It's the default garbage collector. Okay. If you say nothing, in Java 8, which is everything except for four people here, then this is what you get. In Java 11, by the way, the default is G1. Um, so it's called Parallel GC, and it classifies very simply. It's a classic collector. It's a monolithic, stop the world copying new gen. We describe the way it works. It just does that with a lot of concurrent threads concurrent within the collector. Yeah. Um, monolithic stop the world mark, sweep, compact. It does the mark, the sweep, and the compact in place in exactly the mechanism we talked about. It just does it with good parallelism. It spreads the work across CPUs. It's a classic collector. It's a very efficient collector. It's a good collector for throughput. It's a terrible collector if you care about pauses and response time and other things. Okay. Concurrent mark, sweep, GC. CMS, for short. How many of you use or have used the CMS collector? A lot. OK. Good. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. Um, so the CMS collector classifies, surprisingly, as a monolithic stop the world new gen. It's no, not concurrent anything. Um, it's named for its old gen collector, which is a mostly concurrent collector. What does the mostly mean? Sometimes you have to do a stop the world full GC. That's why it's mostly. G1, a monolithic stop the world copying new gen. The G1 part of it is the old gen, a mostly concurrent old gen with a marker, a mostly incremental compacting collector. Why the word mostly? Because sometimes you have to do a full stop the world GC. Okay. So monolithic stop the world has problems. And you could deal with them in various ways. This is one very common way. Let me show you how you measure. And you focus your measurement on, you know, 40 minutes, and you tune until everything's good. But then you notice, ah, there's a couple blips. Maybe I don't have to live with them. But then you look at the day, and it blips all the time, and people call you angry all the time. So that's the world you live in. Or you can basically use creative language to feel good. You could say things like, I guarantee that the worst case, something 99% of the time, you read this, it means absolutely nothing. <laughs> it makes you feel good, though. Like, literally, you can stop for 36 seconds once an hour, and you know, you're good. You, know. um, you can use the word mostly. You can use the word fairly. You can use the um, word typical. Anytime you see those, it's kind of, I'm sorry, I'm not really going to do it right, but let's talk about it. Now, looking at modern collectors, all the modern collectors out there basically do concurrent compaction. It's the thing that everybody's been trying to avoid for 20-some years by pushing it to the future. Modern collectors basically attack the problem. They do concurrent compaction. And let's look at the three that we can talk about here. C4, Shenandoah, and ZGC. C4 is the production collector in the Zing JVM. It's the only collector in the Zing JVM. It's been shipping in Zing in its current variation or form for about nine years and was working on Vega machines before that since about 2005. Shenandoah is an experimental collector in the latest OpenJDK. 
ZGC is also an experimental collector in the latest JDK. I explain what the word experimental means. Not going to belabor it more. Um, let's talk about C4 and how it solves this. And I will say that if you want to understand how ZGC solves things, you just need to look at these slides because ZGC is basically an implementation of the published C4 collector algorithm. Only it does it with one generation. So C4 basically solves the three problems you need to solve in order to eliminate Stop the World. The first one is robust concurrent marking. The next one is compaction that's not monolithic Stop the World. There are variations of doing that. We do concurrent compaction. The last one, and very importantly, is a new generation that is not monolithic Stop the World. We do a concurrent new gen, which is the only concurrent new gen in existence right now. Um, if we classify it, it looks like this. It's a guaranteed single pass marker. It's a concurrent compactor, not partly, not mostly, concurrent. It has a concurrent compacting old generation and a concurrent compacting new generation. It does not know how to do a full GC stop the world. We don't have code that does that. Well, to be fair, we have a flag that says use STW for some experimentation. But like the, that just means say don't let them run when we do it. But it's the same exact algorithm. There is no stop the world fallback for the collector. Now, um, the prime directives are basically to always do the same thing. It's a very simple collector. It avoids any rare code. It avoids any sweeping under the rug. In fact, it will run a f a, an old gen every 10 minutes if you're not idle, just for fun. So that if you run for 30 minutes, you have seen the entire behavior of the collector. We're not in the business of delaying rare things. Similarly, we try not to be in a hurry. Everything we do is designed to happen lazily without anything pressing us except for your pacing and allocation rate. Now, I am running a little over time here, and I know there's a break between us and the next one, and I will be mean and kind of step into it for a few minutes, but I will run quickly through this, okay? Um, the secret to GC efficiency, the secret to feeding RGC well is really simple. If you look at CPU percent versus the heap size, it's very easy to understand that if you have a heap size of a certain set, if you had one empty byte in, in the memory, you would spend all your time chasing it no matter what the algorithm is. Okay? Every gigabyte, I have every byte I allocate, I need to scan a gigabyte in some way, that's not good. There's another intuitive point, which is if I have infinite heap size, I never ever need to collect it, that's super efficient. <laughs> it is. Yeah. And between those points, there's a perfect one over X line as long as you remain linear to the live set. If you do any kind of sweeping, any linear to the heap size, you've got a problem. But if you make sure your algorithms track this line, the secret to GC efficiency is empty memory. You want more efficiency. You want a half the CPU I spent on exactly the same work. Give me twice the empty memory. You want to half it again. Give me twice again. To a point where you just don't care because who wants to half 2% right, by doubling the memory. Right? But that's the simple one tuning thing there you could do. And I won't get into this part because of time, but there's another secret. The secret is to how to maintain concurrency. Not just algorithmically, but what do you need to maintain it? And the math for that is very simple. In a single non-generational heap, in a simple model, you can have really, really easy directives. You have to complete your GC before you run out of empty memory or the application will stall. That's pretty intuitive. It takes you empty heap divided by allocation rate seconds time to finish running out of memory, right? You need to finish your collection before that happens. and the dominant part of the collection is usually the marking. So ignoring, assuming everything else was zero time, the marking alone had better be, you know, is measured by how the live set divided by how fast you can mark the live set. The allocation rate to the marking rate ratio needs to be greater than the empty heap to the live set ratio. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, that's actually backwards. <laughs> yeah. Needs to be smaller then. If it's smaller, then you will stay concurrent. If it's larger, then you will end up pausing. There's no hiding from this, okay? For example, if you're doing 10 gigabytes per second allocation, which is kind of commonplace for 30% utilization on a modern server, and you can mark at a gigabyte a second, which is not too bad, then you need 90% empty heap 
in order to keep up, which is a problem. Now, you want to deal with this, you put a generational heap in place. With a generational heap, you still have to do the same things, right? The same math applies, the same empty heap applies, but the number of seconds it takes us to complete um, a, a mark is the new gen live set divided by the new gen megabytes per second, and the megabytes per second for new gen aren't any better, but that new gen live set is dramatically better for us. And the fact that the new gen live set is in there is what gives you a 10 to 20x win on throughput, or a 10 to 10 20x win on how much empty memory you need to keep up with throughput. And basically, the secret to maintaining concurrency in a concurrent collector is generational collection. Um, so if we look at the modern collectors, we talked about this and this. C4 is a generational collector. Both Shenandoah and ZGC right now are still non-generational. They're still working out the kinks for single generation concurrency. But I fully expect that they will put in a second generation once they're done. Because without that, you can't do concurrency at current application throughputs. So I have run five minutes over time. And I could go into a few more things, but I will fast forward to a very simple part on GC tuning. GC tuning is hard in the sense that you need to know a lot of flags and the right settings. And there are a few more flags you can choose from. <laughs> That's why I didn't do a talk about this. Uh, but modern GC tuning, once you have a concurrent collector and keep, keep up with stuff and, and, and deal with it, is pretty simple. Give it a big heap. <laughs> but that's a waste, right? So shrink the heap, and shrink the heap, and shrink the heap until the damn thing breaks. Then triple it and go home. You have done your entire tuning exercise. You don't need to know any other flags. That is how you tune Zing. Not by giving it a big heap, but by starting with a big heap, shrinking until it breaks, find the thing. There's one big knob. And by the way, this is also true for ZGC and Shenandoah, but that knob ends up being at 10 times the heap size, right? uh, until the generational things come. Um, this is an actual person talking about you know, how they tune GC now, because you know, <laughs> they use Zing. And um, this is actual stuff like, I believe, yeah, this is Cassandra on a modern server. That's the one millisecond pause line. So this is real. Um, I'm going to skip through some of the other ones and simply say, uh, here's a picture of how things look like in production. If you want an application that has daily workloads and weekend loads that look like this and reacts with timeouts and failed stuff, and this is the top 2% of success rate on the left, you turn on Zing on that kind of thing and success rate goes through the roof because timeouts go away. And the way I know that whole thing on the left was GC related is all we did is turn on Zing on the cluster. Uh, and this, this actually happens for real people, real customers in production. This is a sponsored talk, if you didn't notice. So <laughs> you know, I can say those kind of things at this point. Um, so, but with this, this, this I, I'm going to finish the talk here. I've run over time, time by seven minutes already. So I'm going to start folding up to make room. And if people want to ask questions, I'm happy to chat as we do that. Okay? Thank you, everybody. <laughs>